Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. This is the day that the Lord has made. Anybody glad to be in God's house one more time? Come on, I wish I had some help. Anybody glad to be in God's house one more time? You woke up this morning and the sun was shining. It was a beautiful day. Somebody didn't wake up this morning. Somebody didn't wake up feeling well, but you was able to get dressed, put your clothes on, got to your car, had some gas in the vehicle, had a vehicle to get you to church, drove to church, came down the street, wasn't no accident, you didn't blow your tire, I wish I had some help in here. Hey Amen, you got the church safely, walked in here with a smile on your face, and a church to come to. This is the day that the Lord has made. I wish I had some people in here that was just glad to make it to God's house one more time. Anybody had a rough week? Anybody had some long days, but you just pressed your way and you pressed your way and God brought you to his house just one more time. We are grateful to be in this house. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's keep our spirits up and let's help our men. Help our men, help. Let's join in with our men as they lead us and continue to lead us into the presence of God. Amen. Great is your mercy. Lord, be your loving kindness toward me. Your tender mercy I see day after day. Forever faithful towards me. Always providing for me. Great is your mercy towards me. Great is your grace.
make sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. There are many who say, oh, that we might see some good. Let the light of your face shine on us, O oh Lord. You have put gladness in my heart more than more than when their grain and wine abound. I will bow both lie down. I will both lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me lie down in safety. First John three, verses one through seven says, See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. this, but what we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawfulness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or know him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. Let us respond to the word of the Lord. Join us in our hymn this morning, Walk With Me, Lord. Good morning, Christ the King. Family, friends, and visitors. I know it's been a tough week, but you know we made it, and the only reason that we made it is because the Lord was with us. Who wants to walk with the Lord this morning? Are you ready? All right then. Come on, Christ the King. Walk with me.
about you, but I need the Lord to walk with me. 24 7. Amen. It is all to prayer. We need the Lord to walk with our community, with our young people, with our young people. this moment we don't have anyone on our current list but on our bereaved list we want to pray for the family of Everett Krokoff and his uh, nephew is Sharon Phillips and they will be celebrating his life at the Lamb of God Missionary Baptist Church on Tuesday May 14 service at 11 o'clock we want to pray for the Gladney family who funeralized their uncle uh, Leroy Gladney yesterday the Pleasant Hill Missionary Church in Kosciuszko, Mississippi. Let's keep our brother, uh, uh, Curtis Jones, as they funeralized their uncle yesterday, O.C. Jones. Uh, the funeral took place at Pleasant Ridge Church in Chicago, Illinois. And let's keep Sister Geneva Karloff in our, in our family, in her, in her family in our prayers uh, for the passing of Paul Stephen Joseph. Funeral will take place April 19th at First Baptist Church in Inglewood, Nashville, Tennessee. And let's lift your prayers and concerns, our prayers, and also those on the current list. And like I mentioned earlier, let's please lift our young people in our prayer. Uh, that young lady, Miss Robinson, didn't have to go out that way. That's been bothering me since I heard about the story, so let's definitely keep that family in our prayer. As a father, as a preacher, as a person in community with children, it touched me every time my children are violated and hurt. So let's lift to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, great is your faithfulness. We thank you for your goodness and mercy and your endless supply of grace. We thank you that you allow us to see another day. We thank you that you loved us despite our faults and failures and fickle and funny and finite ways. We thank you for watching over us, Lord, while we slept, slumbered, and sleep, and some of us snored. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary for remission of our sins. We thank you, Lord, for being a way maker, a provider, Lord, a promise keeper, a healer, a deliverer, a savior, a blesser. But most important, thank you for redeeming us. Father, we pray right now for each and every person on the sound of my voice in our city, this state, this country, this world that's dealing with some type of issue, Lord. We know that you're able, Lord, because your word reminds us that goodness and mercy is following us all the days of our life. So, Lord, whatever the issue that they're dealing with, Lord, I ask you that you would touch them to deliver them in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray for our city. We bind and cast every demonic and satanic spirit that is attacking our, your children and our children. Father, we pray for peace, which passes all understanding. Father, it's right now that you would touch those that are dealing with the loss of loved ones. Lord, we know that you're able to comfort us like a mother comforts her child. So please comfort us in the time of bereavement, Lord. We pray continue, Lord, that you strengthen our pastor as he pour into us, that you pour into him. Bless our wonderful first lady. Bless our executive pastor. Bless this entire church, Lord. We pray right now, Lord, that you continue to strengthen men that we be the kings that you called us to be, Lord, to lead our house, Lord, to be better than it was before, Lord. We pray your blessings and your mercies on every person on the side of my voice. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray that a word go forth today, that somebody receive help, healing, and hope, and always that a sinner be saved and a saint be strengthened. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. CTK, amen. It's your first time hanging out with us in service. Please, sir, please, ma'am, stand. Amen. We thank God that have worship with us online. Thank you, amen. Hit us a wave button, a heart. Let us know where you're coming from. We thank God for you worshiping with us this morning. Well, I guess it's a family reunion. Let's welcome each other to our Father's house, amen. Amen. <laughs>
Good morning, Christ the King. I'm Ruth the Sinclair, and here's a look at what's going on. Join all the King's men Saturday, April 27th, for our Men's Health Fair. The event starts at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Learn about the importance of regular checkups and talk with health professionals who will be on hand. Saturday, April 20th, we meet up for our Men's Conference. Our theme is Men on the Front Line. Coming from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3. Our guest preacher is Pastor Charles E. Nesbitt, Jr., of Providence Baptist Church in College Park, Georgia. Come wear your favorite football jersey or favorite football apparel. Men's Day is Sunday, April 21st. The attire is, as always, black suits with a black bow tie, and our assessment is $50. Don't forget, all of April, the King's men are collecting toiletries and men's clothing for the McCannon Brown Homeless Sanctuary. Monday, April 29th, is the deadline for submission for the Mayor of the Vicar Scholarship. This is a reminder for your CTK high school seniors. Applications are due by 11.59. Go to the ctkandresources.org to find the scholarship form. Looking ahead, Mother's Day is next month. Starting after service this morning, the Seeds Ministry is selling red and white roses. Red roses indicates mother's living. White roses honor mothers who have passed. It will be taken through May 5th. We are thrilled to announce that our AV ministry is expanding and we would love your assistance. Join our CTK AV ministry social media team and be a part of something amazing. We are looking for friendly and dedicated individuals to join our team to manage and monitor our live stream during worship service. You will be responsible for engaging with our online family and keeping it a positive and safe space. See what I mean? Don't worry, <laughs> training will be hands-on and flexible so you can learn at your own pace. If you are interested in learning more, please use the QR code on your screen or text 414-797-8335. We can't wait to hear from you and have you on our team. If you missed any of these announcements, you can visit our website or follow us on social media, Facebook, and Instagram to stay updated. Christ the King, have a blessed week.
yes you have. You've been good. Oh yes you have. You've been good. Oh yes you have. You've been my mother. Oh yes you have. You've been my mother. Oh yes you have. You've been my father. Oh yes you have. Woke me up this morning. Oh yes he did. Yes, he's been good. Oh, yes, he has. I want to thank you. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you. Oh, yes, I do. Thank you. Oh, yes, you do. Woke me up this morning. Legs to walk. Eyes to see. Oh, yes, I do. I could have been dead. Sleeping in my grave, but you woke me up this morning. Yes, he did. You've been good. Oh, yes, you have. You've been good. Oh, yes, you have. You've been good to me. Oh, yes, you did. When the doctor said I wasn't gonna make it, I made it. Oh, yes, he did. You've been good. Oh, yes, he has. If you don't have nothing to thank him for, thank him for what he's done for me. He woke me up this morning. Yes, he did. He gave me legs to walk. Oh, yes, he did. You've been good. Oh, yes, he has. You've been good. Oh, yes, you have. Lord, I know you've been so good. made and we should rejoice and be glad in it on this second Sunday of this fourth month of this our Lord's year 2024 it's a beautiful day in Milwaukee Wisconsin and we are thankful to God for spring has finally arrived amen and we're thankful Y'all like, oh, I'm calling it too soon. Yeah. We're going to keep hope alive. Thank you, Minister Spruer, for reminding us to pray for the family of Shade Robinson. Unimaginable horrific crime I was watching the news feed and story and they were showing people that were still out searching um, when we looked at the amount of people that was assisting in this initiative it doesn't compare when people of other cultures and nationalities and races are missing. There's almost an army uh, searching and looking for those individuals. Reminds us of the disparity. Malcolm X said that the most disrespected person in America is the black woman most unprotected person in America is the black woman and the most neglected person in America is the black woman. You know we've had conversation and questions and you know what was she doing, where she was doing, it doesn't matter. She could have been walking, she could be anywhere. It really, it really does not matter. 
for the evil that was perpetrated upon her by this monster. And so, pray for justice for her. Pray for justice. And I also invite you to continue. I've, I've reached out to you to continue to fight for justice for a 10-year-old who whose fate is in the hands of you know, the juvenile judge to make the decision whether or not he'll be adjudicated in adult court or in juvenile court. And we remember that incident from uh, 2022 uh, when um, he um, took the life of his mom. He's 12 now. And this month, the decision will be made which courtroom will handle his case. But even beyond that, there's a movement to um, raise the age in Wisconsin for juveniles to be uh, tried as adults. So Wisconsin lowered the age from 12 to 10. I don't know what madman did that. But they lowered the age, I believe, in 1996 from 12 to 10. And it's only, Wisconsin is only one of few states in which a person can be uh, 10 years old and tried as an adult. I don't care what they did. Uh, they're, they're 10. I said they're 10 years old. And so they cannot even participate. You yeah, have grown people can't <laughs> who who have difficulty participating in the legal process and understand the conversations and the, what they're up against, adults, educated adults. Shucks, we just had a referendum, and some of y'all got master's, doctorates, <laughs> and we couldn't interpret those tongues, right? And we lost that referendum, matter of fact, because the way it was it was worded. And so you cannot expect a 10-year-old to really understand the proceedings and he needs, the help he needs is mental health. He needs help for his mental health and that's why we need him to stay in the juvie system for him to be um, adjudicated in that courtroom for him to get the, the type of help that he needs as opposed to just throwing him aside, adjudicating him in adult court, and then when he gets 17, then he's incarcerated for some uh, unimaginable amount of time. We still need to fight for justice, and you can write, you can write, you can write, and write, and write, because if, the, if we don't speak up for those whose voices aren't being heard, then shame on us. We, if we fail to be advocates for the least of these. All right? All right, that's it. I'm going to give you a benediction. And, uh, <laughs> John's Gospel, Chapter 11. The New American Standard Bible Translation, verses 21 and 22 of John chapter 11. And while you're turning, I'm going to thank God for the men again today. But not only the brothers who are rendering choral music, but brothers who are greeters and ushering and just on their post. I'm going to thank all you men for stepping up on in this month of April. And hopefully you'll like it enough, like where you're serving enough to continue to be a part of the ministry. Amen. Do you, have you found it? John chapter 11, the New American Standard Bible. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Amen. I want to 
talk about from complaint to confidence. From complaint to confidence. In the heart of Europe, during the early 20th century, lived a violinist renowned for his unparalleled talent and soul-stirring music he produced. This violinist, we can give him a name, let's call him Johann. He possessed a violin that was as old as it was precious, crafted by one of the great masters. It was his most cherished possession, not just for its monetary value, but for the melodies it birthed under his touch. A tragic incident occurred one evening before a much anticipated concert in a grand hall filled with eager listeners. As Johann prepared backstage, his violin was accidentally knocked off its stand and shattered on the hard floor. The silence that followed was as deafening as the music was expected to be. Unaware of the calamity backstage, the audience waited with bated breath for the performance to begin. In that moment of despair, Johann faced a choice to succumb to his misfortune or to find strength in his faith and love for music. With a heavy heart but unwavering resolve, he chose the latter. He approached the stage with a borrowed violin far inferior to his own, and before he played the first note, he offered a silent prayer, placing his trust in the God who had always been his source of strength. What followed was nothing short of miraculous. Johann played with such emotion, with such skill and beauty that the audience was enraptured. The music transcended the limitations of the modest instrument, touching the souls of all who listened. And that night, Johann's performance was not just a display of his talent, but a testament to his faith and the transformative power of trust in the face of adversity. This anecdote mirrors Martha's journey in John chapter 11, her journey from the despair of her brother's death to the profound trust in Jesus' promise of resurrection and life. And like Johann, Martha faced a moment of crisis that tested her faith. Also like Johann, her story teaches us that when we place our complaints in the hands of God and trust in his sovereignty, we can experience a transformative shift complaint to confidence, witnessing the unfolding of what? Of his more excellent plan for our lives. So in the heart of John chapter 11, we encounter Martha expressing her grief and her faith. And the narrative captures a transformative journey from complaint to confidence offering us a path to navigate our trials with faith. In chapter 10 of John's Gospel, it closes with Jesus and his disciples in a place ironically called Bethany beyond the Jordan River. That place is where John the Baptist came baptizing all of those 
who heard the voice crying in the wilderness and wanted to confess their sins. In chapter 11, a village in Judea of the same name was home to a family of three siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Three siblings who, as disciples of Christ, endeared themselves to Jesus and would often extend hospitality to him and his disciples when he came to their village. Now, the text reveals that the relationship between Jesus and these three siblings was more than casual. It was a deep and affectionate relationship because Mary, Martha, and Lazarus loved Jesus. And as chapter 11 shows, Jesus had a special love for them. The man in the family, Lazarus, fell ill. And the Bible does not speak to the cause or the type of illness Lazarus contracted. But his illness drew great concern from his sisters. And whatever remedies they used, his condition proved to be futile and his health worsened. As Lazarus' condition continued to decline, this prompted his sisters to send word to Jesus to come at once as they believed this illness was one that only he had the power to cure. We don't know who the individual or individuals were who carried the message to Jesus. However, we do know that when Jesus was informed of, about Lazarus's condition, he didn't respond immediately. When reading the narrative in chapter 11 of John, one cannot help but note that it gives pause on several accounts. First, the message from Lazarus' sisters included a special reminder of the relationship between Jesus and the family. It included that special reminder as if to incentivize an immediate response to their petition. In verse 3, it says, the sister sent word to Jesus saying, Lord, he whom you love is sick. True, Jesus loved Lazarus, but he didn't love him any more than he loved anyone else. And that includes you and me. Thankfully, Jesus, unlike us, does not love by degrees, but he loves us all the same with a love beyond human comprehension. The reminder of their special relationship wouldn't serve as a motivation to expedite his answer to their prayers. They thought it would, but it wouldn't. And then secondly, for divine reasons, Jesus delayed. He delayed his journey to where Lazarus lay sick and then made a statement to his disciples and possibly to the messengers that caused them all to wonder. In verse 4, I'm still in the chapter. <clears throat> Jesus said, this sickness is not to end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. 
Now, Jesus' words lay outside the realm of human reasoning and understanding that somehow God would not prohibit but ultimately profit from a situation he could have prevented from happening in the first place. So not only were the words of Jesus surprising, but his actions were equally so in verses 6 and 7. I wish you walked with me through the text. Verse 6 says, so when he heard that he, Lazarus, was sick, he, Jesus, then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. And then, verse 7, after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. Let's go to Bethany. Now, the disciples, when Jesus said, ah, oh, let's go to Judea, they began to push back on the suggestion to journey to Judea because the opposition to Jesus was heightened now and those wishing him harm were emboldened enough to carry out acts of violence toward him. And so at this point, because the disciples were pushing back on going to Judea, remember, they were beyond Jordan in another place called Bethany. And so as they push back, at this point, Jesus makes another statement to, that left the disciples dumbfounded. In verse 11, he said to them, he said, well, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I want to go so I can awaken him out of sleep. And to that statement, the disciples said, Lord, if he's asleep, he'll recover, he'll wake up. And they responded this way because they reasoned that the risk of harm present in Judea outweighed the need to awaken Lazarus from his sleep. And that's what they were saying to Jesus, he'll be fine. That's how they reason. We don't need to risk you being hurt and harmed to just wake him up. He'll, the fever will break. He'll be fine. And then Jesus, in verse 13, clears the air for the readers and for them when the writer says, now Jesus has spoken of his death, his death being Lazarus' death, but they thought, that he was speaking of literal sleep. Now, it's natural for humans to miss the metaphor Jesus used, but I want you to notice, morning, that sleep and death are the same to Jesus. By that, I mean he can wake you up out of either one. So nonetheless, the disciples... They get stuck on the metaphor, and then in verse 14, Jesus had to break it down. He said, the text says, now Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And then verse 15, he said, but I'm glad for your sake that I wasn't there so that you may believe. So let's go to him. And how often, church, do we find ourselves unable to hear the truths spoken or see the lesson on the pages of the Bible because of our failure to rightly divide the Word of God? And other times we get stuck on the simplicity of God's Word because of our erroneously mystifying the scriptures too often we want to mystify God's word when he's telling you something very plainly ask and it 
it shall be given. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and it'll be open. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Ask anything. Do I need to keep going? But we often try to mystify the scriptures when God is saying something to us very plainly. And too often we fail to actualize the promises of God's word in our lives because of unnecessarily complicating the scriptures by superimposing, listen to me, superimposing ambiguity and mystery that isn't even there. The misunderstanding of the disciples wouldn't impede Jesus' intended work. So he begins the journey back to Bethany in Judea and arrives at the outskirts of the village where both sisters met him, Mary and Mark. Now the timeline says Lazarus presumably died after the messengers left Bethany to find Jesus because that journey took one day. Jesus delayed two more days, that's three, and then made his journey, the one-day journey from Bethany beyond Jordan to Bethany in Judea, that took another day. So upon his arrival, Lazarus had now been dead for four days. And this is intentionality on Jesus' part because there was a cultural belief that and superstition, kind of like those, like the man in John 5 at the pool called Bethesda, you know, he said, you know, uh, I'm waiting for the angel to come down and stir the water, and, the, and if the water gets agitated, the first one jumping in, you know, they're going to get healed from whatever condition they have. So, Jesus, you're waiting on the angel? Well, the angel's already here. All you got to do... But there was another superstition that said that the spirit of a deceased person hovered over the body for three days. And those three days would make resuscitation a possibility. So that's why Jesus waited till the fourth day. Because he had to get rid of all the superstition because when he got ready to do what he had come to do, you couldn't do anything but give God the glory and give God the praise. Sometimes he'll wait for you to be in the worst place and then put your back all the way up against the wall before he steps in because he doesn't want anybody to take credit for what he's getting ready to do. And so this crowd of mourners, crowd of mourners from Jerusalem, that's what the text says, had come to Bethany to show their love and support for this family in their hour of grief, and all of them were present when Jesus arrived. So some way, word reached Martha's ears that Jesus had made his arrival. And then her hearing this, she went to meet him and leveled her complaint. Verse 21, she said, Lord, if you had been here looking at, you know, well, she probably didn't have, she didn't have a watch. I'm talking about probably she didn't have a watch. But she knew it took, it, this is the fourth day. And she said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Lord, if you had been here, her words to Jesus show us this morning that the first step necessary to move from complaint to confidence is voicing our complaints to God. I said that's the first step. Martha's initial reaction to this situation is a complaint rooted in a belief in her belief 
that Jesus could have saved Lazarus. She said to him, you could have prevented this thing from happening. But her attitude isn't strange, nor is it disrespectful. It's a, merely a human reaction to pain and to disappointment that we experience in life. See, erroneous theology question God. I said erroneous theology has taught us not to question God or verbalize our disappointments as if there will be divine retribution against our questions of thought. Don't say, just, just, just look, whatever the Lord doing. Just, no, I don't like what I'm experiencing now. Lord, I don't want to do this. So you can rest assured that uh, there won't be any res retribution when we raise questions. You know why? Because God can handle your complaints. Now Martha feels comfortable leveling her complaint, voicing her complaint to Jesus, and she shows us that God welcomes your honesty. Right. See, and like Martha, when life disappoints you, when life seems unfair, we should feel free to bring our complaints to God. The hymn writer said, what a privilege it is to carry everything, not something, but everything to God in prayer. I told you we got some messed up theology. See, God invites us to come to him with our honest feelings, whether they be disappointment, frustration, or grief. And this is the first step in moving from complaint to confidence. See, when we verbalize emotions, whether we verbalize our emotions or not, God already know what you're amusing. Just because you don't say it, don't think he doesn't know. So you might as well say it out loud. If you're sitting around in the dark, you done pull down the shade, start back smoking. Because you're feeling some kind of way, talk back to me. Because you're feeling some kind of way about how life is going and you feel that, that it isn't fair and you don't deserve this and I do all this and now you're letting this happen to me. Go on and tell him he can handle it. God ain't going to be like us. He ain't going to block you. <laughs> It's okay to be honest with your feelings. Jesus teaches us that God values our honesty. He invites us to come to him with our raw emotions and our unfiltered thoughts. He can handle it. Because you don't want to underestimate the power of vulnerability. See, vulnerability is just another word for exposure. Helplessness, openness, weakness. And by expressing her disappointment, Martha models vulnerability. That is, she's modeling her helplessness. She's modeling her openness and her weakness before Jesus and turns it, what she does, look at her, she turns it into a strength, fostering a deeper relationship with Jesus. See, it discloses what? Vulnerability discloses our dependence upon his power and his strength to get us through life's rough and tight places. Ask Joe. He'll tell you that you don't need to fear or hesitate to question God when you are pained by life. Despite his faithfulness, because the text 
His book opens. There's a man in the land of us by the name of Job. He was faithful, upright, righteous before God, feared God, eschewed evil. He had a clean record. But despite his faithfulness, Job is overwhelmed by his misfortune. And then over in chapter 3, he laments the fact that he was even born. And then he questioned why should a guy like him, one that is so dedicated to God, why do I need to endure such suffering? He heard him, I heard him say, that was in chapter 3, but then down in chapter 23, after his world crashed, and he couldn't handle it, he decided that he wanted to subpoena God and bring him into court to argue his case. Verse chapter 23 of Job, this is what he said. He said, oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat, that I can argue my case because life isn't fair. And so what was the outcome? God, God said, oh, oh you subpoenaing me? And God responds, but he, but he responded not by answering Job's questions directly, but he responded to Job by revealing his sovereignty and the vastness of his creation, and that led Job to a place of humility and re renewed faith. And then Job said, though he slay me, yet I'm going to trust in him. But it wasn't only Job, it was also Jeremiah who lamented his difficult position and the persecution that he faced. And then Jeremiah accused God. He, my, he, he, uh, he accused God. I ain't making it up. He accused God of deceiving him and feeling overwhelmed by the ridicule and the rejection that he was encountering. He said, Lord, you deceived me, and I was deceived, and you overpowered me, and you prevailed. And he said, I'm ridiculed all day long. That's in chapter 20. He said, and everybody's mocking me. I'm going through all this because of you. And despite his profound complaints and moments of despair, Jeremiah continues his prophetic ministry. And by doing so, he demonstrates his resilience and his deep faith and his relationship with God is marked by honest communication and it underscores the biblical theme that voicing our complaints to God is part of a dynamic faith journey. So you can tell him how you're feeling about it. David complained in Psalm 22, he expressed profound abandonment and distress when he said, my God, my God, why? Why have you forsaken me? Jesus on the cross is quoting Psalm 22. He said, why, this is David, he said, why are you so far from saving me? Why are you so far from my cry of anguish? But despite his initial despair, David, Psalms offer transition from complaint to trust and praise affirming his faith in God's goodness and his sovereignty. His willingness, David's willingness to lay bare his soul before God, it exemplifies the depth of his relationship with the Lord and it serves as a model for believers in expressing their struggles and their complaints to God. So like Martha's, these examples illustrate church that voicing complaints to God is acceptable and it is part of a broader biblical tradition of engaging with God in honesty and faith. See, voicing our complaints helps us grow in our understanding of God's character. It helps us grow in our faith journey and knowing that our Complaints do not diminish God's love for us. 
So just as Jesus didn't rebuke Martha, God welcomes our grievances. He welcomes them with open arms and a loving heart. So Martha voiced her complaint. And voicing it led her, secondly, to remembering God's sovereignty. Verse 22, because in 21, she said, if you've been here, things be a little different. In verse 22, but the next thing out of her mouth, she said, but even now, even now I know that whatever you ask God, he's going to do it. Despite her complaint, Martha found the path to express a profound confidence in Jesus' connection with God. Her statement reflects a belief in Jesus' sovereignty and Jesus' power. Martha's confidence, listen, it does not deny her pain. It doesn't deny what she's going through. But it places it within the context of God's greater power because Martha's statement reflects her acknowledgement of Jesus' divine authority and God's sovereignty over all circumstances. So even in her grief, in her grief, Martha trusts in God's overarching plan. And this trust church is the cornerstone of moving from complaint to confidence. See, the Apostle Paul said it this way in Romans 8, 28. He said, and we know. That's, that's your declaration. That, that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. That's your, that's your consolation. To those who are called according to his purpose, that's the affirmation. You can go back and watch it live and get those three things. See, in our moments of complaint, we have to remember God's sovereignty. What is his sovereignty? Sovereignty is God can do whatever he want to do, when he want to do it, how he want to do it. Don't have to get anybody permission to do what he's going to do. That's a non-theological definition of, of his sovereignty. Because our circumstances, listen to me good, our circumstances might not change immediately. But knowing that God is in control, if you just know that God is in control, it can shift your focus from your problem to his power. And this confidence, it doesn't ignore our pain, but it trusts in God's ultimate plan. So Martha displayed what I call an even now faith in Jesus. And that's important because on life's journey, there can be times when you're going to need an even now faith. Remembering God's sovereignty helps you to say, I know things are looking real bad, but even now. I know there seemed to be no way out of this mess, but even now. I was told that it was too late, but Lord, even now. See, that's the kind of faith that the Clark sisters sung about when they said, expect the impossible, see the invisible, feel the intangible. Why? Because the sky is the limit to what I can have. So despite her circumstances, Martha's even now faith illustrates how our confidence in God's sovereignty can provide strength and peace in turbulent times. I'm, I got one more thing to say. To move from complaint to confidence, then you have to embrace Jesus' promise of life. 
Because he said to her in verse 25, he said, he said, well, I am. And I ain't got time to talk about the I am. But, but whenever he say I am, yeah, that's the same I am. I, I'm, I said I'm going to talk about it, but here I go, right? It's the same I am that spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, I am. Same I am that showed up when he came walking on the water and they was afraid. He said, be not afraid, I am. He said, I am the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me will live even though he dies. Jesus' response to Martha, church goes beyond addressing her immediate grief because it offers the hope of eternal life available to all who believe in him. Now Jesus doesn't dismiss her feelings, but what he does is redirects her focus to the eternal life that he offers. Because in chapter 10, he had already said, I come that they might have life. And then over in chapter 14, he, he declared, I'm the way of the same gospel. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So all of this life talk is the foundation of our confidence. And so by focusing on Jesus' promise, we can shift our perspective from our earthly troubles that bespeak death, shift them to the eternal hope and joy found in Jesus that point to a confidence rooted in God's promises of life. And this confidence, it will transform our perspective. This confidence will help us see beyond our current struggle, help us see our eternal hope in Christ. Because embracing Jesus' promise, that will empower us to do what? To live confidently, knowing that our ultimate future is secure in him regardless of what we go through in this life. So Martha's journey from complaint to confidence, it mirrors our spiritual journeys. And it is a powerful testimony to the transformative power of faith. And by being honest with God, when you can remember his sovereignty, when you can embrace the promise of eternal life, then we too can navigate our darkest moments. We can navigate it, them rather with unwavering confidence. I'm going to leave you when I tell you to let this story inspire you to trust in God's unfailing love and to trust in his ultimate plan for your life. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? He said, this situation is for the glory of God. What what Lazarus is going through, what Mary, Martha, what they're going through is for the glory of God. And then so that the Son of Man might be glorified by it. Church things may not appear to be able to produce glory, especially when you're in the midst of the storm. When you're going through, it don't look like anything uh, glorious. It's going to come out of this. But Jesus said that some way, somehow, that God will get the glory. <clears throat> so we can move forward this morning with the confidence that God is in control. I think that's good news this morning to know that whatever you're dealing with, whatever you're going through, no matter how gray your sky has been, no matter how powerful the opposition might seem to be, just know that God is 
in control. And if we move forward with the faith uh, that he is in control, God will, uh, I'm going to add, in his own time. God will, yes, transform our complaints to confidence. When we remember his sovereignty, we can transition from the valley of, of frustration to the mountaintop of faith. I say when we can remember his sovereignty, when we can remember Jesus' promise of life, we can transition from a valley of frustration to the mountaintop of faith. I heard the songwriter say, uh, have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about your troubles. He'll hear our faintest cry and he'll answer by and by. It went on to say, you can feel a little prayer wheel turning. Is that right? And he said, you can know that the little fire is burning. And you can find, I ain't going to crank it up, but you can find a little talk with Jesus. We'll make everything all right. Can I get a witness here? Anybody here this morning? Have you ever had that kind of talk? When you couldn't see your way out? When you were at your wit's end? When your back was up against the wall? When the world came crashing down? Anybody here this morning ever had a talk with Jesus? Isn't God all right? He will answer by and by. Won't he do it? I said, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Yeah! I know that he will. Do you know he will? Is it anybody over here ever tried him for yourself? How many know that he will answer by and by? What about in this section? Do I have any testimonies that he will answer by and by? Well, I don't want to leave you out here. Do I have anybody here that say I tried him and I know for myself he will answer by and by. This side is anybody it will try Jesus when the night was so dark, the sun wouldn't shine in your world, but you had that talk with Jesus. And in the morning, in the morning, in the morning, somebody said, weeping me endure for the night but joy how many know joy joy won't it come in the morning say yes say yes 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 joy it'll come in the morning had a little talk with Jesus and tell him all about here. Answer. Jesus, and he made it 
want today, I want to extend to you an invitation to Christian discipleship. If you're in this sanctuary this morning and you haven't made that commitment to Jesus Christ, or life is going to put you in some places where you're going to need to shift from complaint to confidence. And so you can come and get it right with God and Christ on the day. Somebody else, he will hear. And I know yes, by and by. Hey, hey, feel it turning. And I know the fire is burning. Cause I had a little talk with Jesus. And he made it right. Somebody else ought to come this morning. If you're here and you're out of the church, you need a church home. You've been visiting for a while. Come on and make that connection. You can do it if you're standing next to someone who you know should make that decision for Christ. You know, tell them, I'll walk with you. I'll walk with you. Tell them, I'll walk with you. And those who are joining us virtually, I'm going to extend to you the same invitation for Christian discipleship. And you can come today. There's a form. You can scan that QR code or just visit our website. There is a place for you to complete a membership form, and we'll be so delighted for you to join this great family of faith. If that's you, won't you come? And in this room again, if you know someone is standing next to you, tell them I'll walk with you. Say I feel the prayer we're turning, and I know fire is burning. I'm on One more time. so much from the Lord. Thank you, Lord. And then we come to honor him in our, in our gifts, our sacrifices. This is in his offering time. I want to say to you, those who are joining us virtually, there's space for you to also support the ministry. Those of you who are uh, virtual congregants, amen. We need your support amen. as well. You can utilize Right there on your screen, you'll see all those methods you can use to uh, give to keep the ministry moving forward. Congregation, I want to thank you for your continued faithfulness in your giving. God bless each of you for prioritizing the work. Thank you for having your heart, your heart into the work of, of kingdom growth. Also, those of you who shared in our devotionals during Lenten season, thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for your gifts. If you have not done that, I need you to do that uh, today, if you can and will. Uh, we will be uh, surrendering our gift to So Send Out You this week. Uh, we're waiting for everyone to, to give. And so thank you for what you've done to support foreign missions. And trust that your $60 can go a long way in ministering to the needs of the least of these. God bless you. Thank you. Next Sunday is our men's uh, celebration. Our brothers want to invite you out this coming Saturday. Uh, to be the, we'll have our men's gathering, our conference uh, in the Quality of Life Center. I think you're supposed to wear some kind of uh, 
What kind? Wear Chiefs apparel. <laughs> Deacon Fortune said you're supposed to wear Kansas City Chief attire. <laughs> he will be the only one there in that attire. <laughs> but uh, we thank you for thank you for that push, though. He's, I, I gotta give it to him. You know, he's he's a great he's a great fan of those Chiefs. <laughs> but he's been living in Packer country for quite a while. We're gonna convert him. We gonna keep. He'll be converted. <laughs> but you're supposed to wear some sort of athletic kind of thing if uh, it's football, right? It's football, football, yeah. Football already, y'all. God, dog. <laughs> football here already. And then uh, and then we have our guest speaker, the Reverend Dr. Charles Nesbitt, will be our conference facilitator and uh, morning preacher. All right? Amen. Hey, be safe. Enjoy this day. I'm telling you, this is a beautiful day on the outside. <laughs> before the presence of his glory. He'll do it all with exceeding joy because he is the only wise God, our Savior. So to him be power and might now and forever. Let us sing our man together. Oh. 